Uh, hello, morning uh, or afternoon, depending on what time you're listening. Um, welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Friday Club, courtesy of Campus 24. And as always, in association with our friends at Amkiss, my name is Dominic Moon, and I'm your host of the fortnightly interviews with some of the biggest names in admissions and the marketing arena. Slight change of tack this week, folks, as my guest is not a marketeer or an admissions professional, otherwise known as non-teaching or support staff, but in fact comes from the common room. But do not switch off yet, as I hope by the end of this interview, you will see why I asked him to join. Dr. Andy Kemp is principal of the National Mathematics and Science College based in the Midlands on the edge of the Warwick University campus. The National Mathematics and Science College, uh, we'll call it NatMat, so it'll be easier, is the top performing specialist STEM sixth form day and boarding school in the UK. Nice plug. Joining Nat Matsai was something of a homecoming for him as he studied for his BSc in Mathematics, PGCE, MSc and EDD, and other words and letters are available in Mathematics Education, all at the University of Warwick. More recently, he did some more letters, MBA at UCL in 2017. You'd think he's more of an English teacher than a mathematics one. He was spoken at conferences around the world in relation to the role that technology plays in education and in particular mathematics education and has been published in several journals, magazines and collective works. Ah, Dr. Andy, welcome. Thank you very much. I sound far more impressive than I really am. I, I like that intro. Thank you. You're more of a marketeer than you realised, I'm suspecting. <laughs> okay. Good, good so, so listen, right, these interviews are are by marketing and admissions people for an audience of marketing and admissions professionals. I'm sure we've got some other interested people out there. Now, that you are not. Yet, oddly, many of the people that are on the international recruitment scene know you very well and would say, to some degree, you are one of them. You have somehow managed to bridge the gap between the academic and the commercial. So I have a question. Do you feel that the landscape is changing and that from the academic side of the coin, uh, the heads, uh, see what I did there, um, need to have the awareness um, far more than they currently do? Yeah, I, I think absolutely the scene is changing. Um, I think those those quaint old days um, where the head could sit in front of the fire with his Labrador uh, and wander around the school a little bit are, are long, long gone. Um, we are running small to medium sized businesses with turnos, turnovers of somewhere between three to probably 30 million pound a year. Um, and, and if we don't recognize that those are commercial exercises, then they won't be truly successful. Uh, and we produce the best educational experiences and the best educational outcomes for our young people by recognizing that we're also running a business. Um, you, you can't you can't do them in isolation. And I think increasingly the role of the head or principal is is as much CEO as it is anything else. Um, and you see this in, in some schools. You've got kind of some of these big schools where um, heads have moved into these kind of executive head roles or kind of CEO type roles, which really recognize the business uh, side of the role. But then appoint a kind of head of school or a head of college type role underneath who can focus on that kind of day to day experience. Uh, and I think understanding both is crucial to the success of any any school these days. Mm. OK. Is it fair to say, this is a little bit cheeky of me, a little bit naughty, quite frankly, but is it fair to say that um, some heads may think, well, it's only marketing or it's only admissions. It's quite easy. I'm going to have perhaps more of an interest than I should and meddle more than I should. I, I think that's absolutely fair. And if I'm honest, that's probably where I started. Um, so I, I've been kind of looking after marketing and admissions now for goodness me, probably about seven years on and off uh, in a, across a couple of two or three schools now um, as part of my role. Uh, initially, it was to fill a gap. Um, and I thought, how hard can it be? Turns out quite hard. Uh, <laughs> but it's been a wonderful learning experience. Um, and I think to some extent, I'm, I'm much better able to do my job now having gone through the ringer and worked out all the things that I didn't know. And the kind of, yeah, when I started, I thought, really just about producing a nice glossy leaflet isn't it I, I can write some text for a nice glossy leaflet i'll give it to the marketing department they can be a little pretty i'll print it off and then i just hand them out and, and the, the kids will all just turn up won't they 
T -t Turns out that doesn't work. Strange. I think there'll be a lot of people taking quite a bit of heart from the, uh, the fact that you said that and you have half the alphabet after your name. Um, <laughs> and to say it actually wasn't as easy as one thought. It, and I've, I kind of agree with you in as much as it's new head syndrome where they kind of um, sort of grad migrate towards the market emissions department because it's yeah. probably a dark art to some degree and uh, perhaps staying back and watching from afar yeah. might have been a better strategy initially do you think yeah i think i think it's really i i, I think being a new head full stop is really hard uh, yeah. because most new heads don't know what they don't know um we we come up through the ranks we come up the pastoral side we come up the academic side whatever it is we come up through um our exposure to marketing is generally fairly light um along the way um and suddenly we're responsible for every aspect of college life in every in, in every part uh, and suddenly we're learning very quickly and often what happens i think for, for new heads is you get a term in and somebody starts going has anybody looked at the numbers for next year yet uh, and, and and suddenly they start to panic a little bit and they're like, well, I don't know, maybe, is it all right? I don't know. What, what, what's normal? What's good? And that's the point where sometimes they can overreact and get overly engaged without really knowing what it is they're asking because they haven't been prepared for it. I do think there's a significant gap in the sector in terms of staff development for the upcoming heads. Um, kind of, There are lots of really great courses out there which focus on how to get a headship. Um, there aren't very many good courses out there for that actually say, well, what do you need to know once you're there when you're actually doing it? Yeah. Uh, and I think there's there's something there that really needs to be looked at. If you just listen really, really carefully now, everybody, we can just hear Russell Spears penning something ready to <laughs> rock and roll. I promise you now, no stone until. Can I just ask um, about um, being ahead? And it's, it's 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 really great to have you because do you. <laughs> Have you written like a vision document? Could we hear about school strategy, business strategy? We're a business, COO, CEO, more letters for you to, to get your hands into. Have, have you as a head written a vision document? Because that has to feed back to eventually the marketing team to bloody work out what they need to go and sell, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and, and that kind of that iterative process is quite hard in a school because you've got you've got your kind of what what do we want to do? What's our vision? What's our goal? Uh, you've also got what does the market want? Uh, and, and if those two aren't talking to each other, it's all well and good if what I want to run is a specialist rugby college. But if I want to do that in a part of the country where nobody wants to play rugby, then I'm, I'm wasting my time. Uh, and so I need to know both what I believe in and what the school believes in holistically as, as a good educational experience. But I also really need to know what the market's looking for in my area and, and what I think I can sell. Um, and I'm, I'm using that scary word of sell uh, because because it's really important because it's a sales job. Um, yes, we are about trying to convince people that the educational experience is the one that we want. And so so it, it, in some grades, it's easy for me at the moment because I'm both marketing and admissions and I'm the principal. So I get to dovetail those two things together myself. I don't have to go through the loops that I think are would often get lost, where actually if, if the head's not having that conversation with the marketing team early enough, they get presented with this fake complete of a kind of here's the vision. This is what I need you to go and sell. And they're going, this is not what the market asked for. This isn't yeah. this isn't going to work. Um, so from my end, it, it's a little bit easier. Um, and so I can kind of look at it from both sides as I'm putting that together and going, well, what do I think based on my experience of, of leading marketing as well? That my my parents are looking for what kind of things are they after? How can I make sure that I'm able to deliver the things they want and then talk about the fact that we're delivering the things that they want yeah. um, as and a it, kind of coherent whole? And it's not a question, by the way, everybody, I know Dr. Andy really well, so I have to cut him off every now and again. Uh, teachers. You do. Um, so it's not a question oh. of just creating um, sort of the sort of words, sort of kindness, integrity, learning, passion. It's not, that's not a vision document, is it? <laughs> you can, you've no, seen them though, haven't not. you? <laughs> I have indeed. The, the number of um, uh, those acrostic type things where you've kind of got somebody's picked a lovely word and then they've got words coming off. It's, it, that, that's not a vision document. Um, vision documents. Yeah, it's got to be ambitious uh, and it's got to talk about where you want to get to. Um, so we will talk about being the, the most preeminent STEM college in the world. That That's our vision. That's where we want to get to. Uh, we want to be the place that people look to when they think about what brilliant STEM education looks like. Um, and that that then becomes an operational document when you start talking about, well, what does that mean? 
So when you start thinking about things like, well, how do we get people to know about us? How do we deal with brand? Uh, how are we dealing with things like outreach? How are we dealing with things like marketing and all of those different aspects? And how are we making sure that what we deliver lives up to that vision as well? And so it's kind of, it's all multi-leveled. So at one level, you need this kind of big grand statement um, about kind of ambition. It's, it's, the, it's like the old NASA one, kind of what are we doing? We're putting a man on the moon. Uh, and what, what's the cleaner doing there? The cleaner is helping put a man on the moon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that, that's a, you need that kind of rallying cry um, bit to w- what you are and who you're about. Because I think it's really hard if your vision is to be the best local day school. Yeah. OK. OK. So I want to continue on another theme, which is uh, and you've heard me speak about this before. Uh, you may be able to put a different perspective on it, uh, on it to our usual guests. We often talk about internal marketing, the common room. Uh, our admissions and marketing people are hugely or always under-resourced, overworked, underpaid in some cases. Yep. They need more help, content, input, understanding from from the common room. Um, are we asking for something that'll never happen? A noble pursuit, indeed, a pipe <laughs> dream, perhaps? Um, no. I, I don't think it's impossible. Um, I do think it's quite difficult and I do think it requires a lot of nuance. Um, I think one of the problems has always been that sense of them and us. Um, and I think one of the challenges is always around pace. Um, kind of marketing and admissions is a very fast driven part of the school life. Um, and teachers by their very nature are very busy people doing lots of bits and things. Um, And so you've got to try and achieve two things, I think, in your interaction with the common room. One is to help them understand why this is really important. Um, And some of that is a little bit self-indulgent as well. Find opportunities for them to have a little bit of Uh, self-promotion. Teachers like that kind of thing. Um, But also recognize that if an event happened today, it's not unrealistic that it might take them three or four days to write anything about it. Um, you're, you're not going to get your write up on the day. It just, they have other things they have to do. They have other places they need to be. Uh, and marketing is always going to be very low on their list of things. Um, but like anybody, if they feel recognized, if they feel listened to, if they feel like you care about them, you're much more likely to get what you want from them. Okay, that's going back to the marketing missions love bomb in the common room. Uh, and a little bit yeah. of a, a chocolate brownie or something doesn't go amiss yeah. as well. Don't, donuts are the answer to most of life's problems, as far as I can tell. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, mate. Uh, you very kindly presented to over 70 uh, Metropolis Education Partner Schools on, more letters, chat GTP. Do these AI developments excite you? What would you say to the marketing emissions fraternity? Run for the hills at your peril or embrace it and stay <laughs> current? 50-50, how much of a panic and, uh, and uh, a sort of a head spin should our marketing emissions people be at this particular point in time? I, I'm very excited about, I'm, I'm always very excited about new technology, always. Um, but uh, artificial intelligence, is one of those utter game changers. It, it, it's going to change the world. It's going to be as seismic, if not more so, than the internet was um, in terms of the way it changes our approach to a whole host of things. Um, and I think for marketing emissions, and particularly for many of our, our friends and colleagues who are working in schools with not very much support, small teams, uh, those kind of things, the, the opportunity for AI to just do some of the heavy lifting, I think will be transformative. Um, during that talk I gave, I, t- I talked about kind of asking an AI to read an article uh, about an event that happened in the school and write me a series of social media posts for them. So it knows how long they should be. It will think about what kind of um, Twitter ha- uh, hashtags and those kind of things to use in it. Those kind of things, which take time and they take yeah. quite a lot of time. Uh, and there are very, very few schools up and down the country that have like a copywriter on their staff. Um, there are a lot of ways where AI can be much more efficient. And I think also, kind of looking at that whole big data, data science move stuff that uh, is becoming really prevalent in the background. I think kind of over the next three to five years, I hope we'll end up with admission systems, which give us much more nuanced reporting uh, without us spending hours churning the data by hand. And often, sadly, in marketing admissions departments, there are people who aren't particularly data savvy because that's not the key part of the job. Uh, And they're being asked to produce reports and explain statistics that they don't feel comfortable with and, and therefore, a lot of those stats are not particularly meaningful or even valid. Um, and so I'm really optimistic that AI will take some of the heavy lifting away. What it won't do is take away the creative human touch. 
Um, though those brilliant marketing campaigns that we see time and time again from schools up and down the country, where they find that little niche that's just right for their community. Um, I don't think AI is going to get there anytime soon. I, I think it would be great, though, for that first draft, uh, prepping a, a report, prepping a paper, giving you some ideas to reflect upon. And then it'll come back to the people in the team to to turn it into something really magical. Yeah. So so so, so just to give some uh, an insight on this, you can go to your own website, cut a news item from yeah. your current news page, drop that into the the drop box on chat GTPT. Yeah. Say write me social media post for Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, yeah. are, and it does it with the hashtags. Yeah. The whole sprang. See, Perfect. everybody, <laughs> that's it. Don't be afraid of it. No. Embrace it to some degree, but it won't have that emotional element that will know after you've done your vision document and you've got your yeah. plan and your strategy, it won't have that emotional element to, to help you make that most amazing advert, but it will help you do yeah. some of the grunt work quite helpfully. Yeah. Yeah. And it will get better. And I think this is the really exciting thing. Chat, chat GPT as a concept is a very broad brushstroke attempt at AI. Um, but you can imagine a kind of uh, a social media management software package, which learns your writing style. It learns what you want to say. It learns the kind of hashtags that you use naturally. And then you just go kind of, I'd like some stuff on this, give the link to the thing, press go, and it creates and sends all of those um, social media posts automatically for you in the background. Kind of, yeah. That's not a million miles away from where we are today, but but the idea that it can be much more bespoke, much more trained on you, kind of what what your school says, how your school says it, because there's no reason why we can't give it your entire Twitter feed to read and go, well, okay, that's what you write, that's how you write. Yeah, I can yeah. write in that style now, and and that's okay. I think where the exciting stuff will come. Just tell me one thing, because you showed this curve, which was quite interesting to see where the growth. So it's been it's been in the making for sort of decades yeah. and decades, 50, 60 years. And now we're at the point where the the reason why we're all talking about it now is because it's on this trajectory, which is kind of going to be, I guess, yeah, like that. Absolutely. Um, so what we've got at the moment, so let's say we've got a nice Ford Fiesta. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't know why I said Ford Fiesta. So next year, that's going to be like a BMW M3, isn't it, in terms of its power and its... Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, so the, the, the rule I was discussing in the talk is something called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says broadly computing power doubles every two years. Um, and and, and the, the observation I made is that the fastest supercomputer in 1985, a computer called Cray 2, which was the size of my school, pretty much, it was a giant building, is now less powerful than the watch I wear on my wrist. Uh, and, and so in, in 35 years, we've gone from something the size of, of a, a building to something I can wear as I walk around. Um, and so we know that the power of this technology will grow. Uh, and we learned a lot during COVID about exponential growth. Exponential growth is really quick. Um, and so we've been in those, as you say, these kind of foothills for a while. Uh, and ChatGPT has just tipped it into public domain because we've now got something that's quite interesting. Um, but from this point, doubling from here is really scary and really impressive. Whereas doubling down here, kind of, it wasn't enough for anyone to notice. And the rumours are at the moment that chat GPT-4, so the engine that underlies this, which is due in the next year or so, might be as much as kind of four or five hundred times as powerful as the one we're currently using. Uh, I've, so, got put, I've got to put you on something there because you, I think your mathematics is wrong. No way is 1985, 35 years or so ago. No way. <laughs> Honestly, it's, scary, it's, isn't it? it's, it's 10 years ago at top. I tell you that, mate. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. Okay, let's whiz you out of your comfort zone back into so the chat GTP. Let's talk about something else. So you are arguably in the nichest of niche schools. You're asking, you are trying, you're kicking over rocks. Yes. And you are turning over logs, trying to find these little nuggets of pupils around the world. So what does the strategy document look like for you rather than, um, you know, is, is it sort of a, how do you go about finding yes. these very, very clever scientists and mathematicians are you going, oh, oh, just the whole thing is complex, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it really is. So it, it's really interesting because I think when I first started, I tried to do a little bit of what I'd done in other schools, which right. is you, you kind of, you, you go to kind of big events and you hope that there's enough traffic there that you meet enough interesting people that a handful of them convert into something. Uh, the, the reality is most of the kind of student-facing, parent-facing fairs I attend 
I, I would be lucky if I spoke to one or two people across the day uh, because they've got to be really interested in STEM. They've got to be really good at STEM. They've got to be a sixth former. Uh, and, and so by the time I've got to that, I've filtered them down to of the maybe 50 parents who turn up. There's probably three that I could speak to across the day that are actually interested in me. So our approach has really shifted and it, it now forms a kind of uh, a, a kind of two parallel streams. So one is uh, working with a, a wide group of agents. So we have a wider agent base than, than I would choose in another school um, because I speak a lot of the time to agents who will say, we only see a child that looks like that maybe every two or three years. I'm like, that's fine. I don't need you to send me massive numbers. I need you to send me the really good kids when they want to do something that's really bespoke. Uh, and so kind of in some markets, whereas in maybe in, in another school, I might work with one agent or maybe two agents. Uh, I might be working with six or seven because together, collectively across that region, they'll send me one or two kids a year. Uh, and that's fine. So agents are a really key part of it and managing that that relationship. Um, so we we spend a lot of time uh, going to things like ISEF, Alfie, um, BBSW, those kind of events where we can meet good agents and talk with them in depth about what makes the college special and interesting. Um, the other side, though, which, again, is quite different to what I've done in other schools, is is much more direct marketing. So okay. we spend a lot more time and a lot more energy on things like Google adverts, social media advertising, um, because students find me that way around. Because actually, because we're so niche, that student who sat in their room going, I really, really want to go to a school that loves maths. Uh, how do I find a school that loves maths? And they go to Google and they type, best school for maths in UK. And I'll, I'll come up as the top link on there. And, and they contact me. And so there are, and I, I see that a lot with students who come from countries we don't work in. Um, so I, I don't do any work at the moment in Nigeria, um, but I've had a couple of students from Nigeria most years who find us online, contact us, go through the process because they're excited about what we're offering. And so part of my work, and I'd say a good chunk, probably more than in any other school I've worked in, quite a lot of my marketing spend goes on brand, um, yeah, yeah. making people aware that we exist and what we're doing, because actually once they know that we exist, they're really excited about us. The 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 fact that you went to these big events early, did you feel that's a fail? Did you, or did, was, there, was there currency in that? Did, was there a learning? I mean, it wasn't a waste of money and time, was it? No, absolutely. No, no, it's, nothing is ever a waste of money and time uh, unless you let it be. So some of those events, what I learned was I was in the wrong place. Uh, and that, that's fine. And that, that's a useful exercise in its own right. I learned that this is not the event that I should be attending because I'm not going to get the value from it. Um, but also, you, you talked at the beginning about the fact that uh, many of our, our friends and colleagues across the sector see me as one of them. That, that's because I've spent a lot of time on the road as well over the years with them. Um, and if I'm at a fair and it's quiet, I will make sure that I walk the room. I talk to everybody. I want to know what they're doing. I want to engage with them because I learn a lot from the other, what other people are doing. And actually, one of the things I love about the, the kind of what, the work that Metropolis has done is bringing together all of us to learn from each other. Um, and so any event I'm at, there's always something of value for me to take from it. Sometimes it's this is the wrong market. Sometimes this is it's the wrong type of event. Uh, but sometimes there's value just in brand awareness. So I went to um, uh, BBSW, uh, sorry, uh, the Battersea show uh, a year and a half ago or something. Um, I spoke mostly to parents of three to five year olds. Um, but I had a big stand at the front of the hall and thousands of people walked past it and saw our name and saw our brand. Uh, and that can only be a good thing. Now, it's not an event I would go to regularly because it's not a good recruiting event for me. But that's not to say it doesn't have value. Uh, it's just about thinking creatively about the value you can take from every opportunity. Can you just uh, do the thing where I've, I've heard it from you before, where, where you ask a pupil what are their interests and how, how you use that as a filter? Do you know when you say, do you yeah, do so, like, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, w w w one of the classic uh, conversations I'll often have with kids is kind of, w what are your views on sport? Do, do you like sport? If you really like sport, don't don't come to me. You're not going to enjoy it. It's 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 not it's not going to be what you want. We we don't do competitive sport. We do competitive maths because competitive maths is much more fun as far as we're concerned. Um, and it's not that sport doesn't have value. I think sport is brilliant and a wonderful part of of a good education. But actually, for my young people at the age they're coming to me, 
if they're interested in competitive sport, there are better schools out there for them. And that's fine. I'm, I'm really relaxed about that. I don't need to be for everybody. I just need to provide the best educational experience for the people who want to come to me. Yeah. Simple, isn't it? Simple. And then, you know, it saves us all looking ridiculous trying to put a round peg into a square hole and, and chase those Absolutely. numbers. We're not going to go down the fallacy of numbers. I did have that in my notes today, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, so, so instead, just to recap, really, uh, brand, outreach, uh, marketing, delivery, have a vision document, know your markets. Don't, 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 don't think everything's a failure because you're always something to learn. I think there's a really valuable lesson out there. Bursas will think differently, gang. That's that's just yeah. the different colours we are. We've got reds, blues, yellows and greens for anybody who realised that. And sometimes we're just not talking the same language. But there is value in, in most things. And you've got, you know, you've done a, a, an outstanding job uh, in such a short period of time uh, with a school that most people would be standing around scratching their head going, how the hell do we... How do we <laughs> <laughs> we do this. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a fantastic place, and and it's a joy to lead here. It really is. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, right now, listen. Just to um, just to finish off for the for our Friday club, my standard questions, uh, which just to give us an interest, uh, an insight into who you are and what you're <laughs> about. So let's have a think. That's about a scary that. thought. Yes. Who is your hero? Um, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> you after that, my. I bet you've got. I bet you've got a mind palace, haven't you? Properly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will I will be retreating to my mind palace later to to dwell on all that we've discussed. Apart from twenty two B Baker or twenty two B Baker Street, whatever it is, where if you could live anywhere, where would it be? Oh, um of the places I've been, uh Hong Kong. I, I love Hong Kong. Absolutely love it. Well, I think we're all there in, in the next three to six weeks, everybody. Uh biggest fear. Boredom. I, I, I'm, I'm terrified of being bored. That's what that mind palace is for then. Um, yeah. Be beach or snow? Snow, any day of the week. Okay. Uh, right. This is going to be interesting. A karaoke song. Nah. Um, Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Okay. Uh, nickname? No, never had one. Only Andy. Okay. Well, it's Dr. Andy from now on, everybody. Uh, <laughs> if, if you went back in time, where would you go? Uh, the very beginning. I want to know how it all started. <laughs> That's too clever for us. Uh, and what is the one thing you'll never do again? Uh, my own plumbing. I, I, I plumbed a kitchen in a house once 20-something uh, years ago. It was fine and it all worked, but I'm never doing it again. Never, ever. When you uh, said your own, your own plumbing, I was thinking, have you sort of done surgery on your hernia or something like that? No, 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 no. So we, we, we fitted our own kitchen in, in, in our first proper house after we got married. Uh, and I, I got some advice from my father-in-law, who'd been a plumber, uh, and, and we we did it all. And it was fine, and it did all work, but I'm never, ever going near it again. Yeah, I'm with you. Same as painting <laughs> for me, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, everybody, uh, I told you that was worth waiting for. Some absolute nuggets in there from the other side of the living room, almost, or the common room, or whatever you want to call it. Not a, a support or not one of the girls in the office, as they say, uh, but a really good, insightful. Um, and I'm sure Andy would say, if you ever want to know anything about ChatGPT, then I'll just ping him an email because he'd be more than happy to to. Delighted see to. It. Absolutely. You can find me on Twitter and at, uh, at Andy Kemp uh, or on LinkedIn. Do feel free to get in contact. Love to speak to people. All on brand, as always. Right. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everybody at home. And I hope you enjoyed that. And we'll see you in two weeks for another fabulous uh, guest. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.